Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Venable's uh, Political Advertising Advertising Technology presentation as part of our Privacy Law and Policy Webinar Series. Um, maybe some of you attended yesterday's uh, session on the CPRA. Um, but today we're talking about political advertising and uh, ad tech. And joining me, I'm Rob Hartwell. I'm an associate in privacy practice here at Venable. Um, joining me is the chair of our political law practice, Ron Jacobs, who is um, very immersed in political advertising, regulations around it, and the intersection of that and ad tech. Um, so hope you're all uh, excited for a, a, a good one-hour session here. Uh, we'll give you some insights, um, give you some, some things to think about, and uh, uh, to bring back to organizations. So uh, we'll start here with a brief agenda. Uh, we're going to do, just because it's topical and uh, top of mind with six days to go to the election, um, some potential issues that might arise in the election. Uh, with Ron here, we thought it would be a good uh, use of our time to plumb his expertise and um, learn a little bit more about the process and what could go wrong, um, which I'm sure is uh, not stressful for anybody. Uh, then we'll go through um, how policymakers view the ad tech industry and how it intersects with political advertising, um, how kind of the legacy regulation, regulators um, are, are coming to terms with the new ways um, of using uh, ad tech and political advertising. Go through some of the proposed federal regulations, some of the existing state regulations, and um, how those are being applied. We'll talk about industry self-regulation with the Digital Advertising Alliance's political ads program, how that came about, what it means, what it does. And then we'll talk about kind of some factors to, to consider when you're thinking about engaging in political advertising in your organizations, um, whether that's accepting political ads, engaging in political advertising, just some things to think about as you come into the field. Uh, as a reminder, uh, if you're attending here for CLE credit, um, Venable is an improved provider in New York and uh, California. Um, other states, you will need to submit your own, on your own um, to get credit. But there will be a code announced halfway through the presentation. Um, and if you are submitting uh, CLE forms, you'll need to put that um, code into the, the form, which will be emailed to you next week. So with that intro out of the way, I'm going to turn it over to Ron and let him discuss uh, the potential chaos of the election. Great. Thanks, Rob, and thanks, everyone, for attending today. Um, you know, political ads are obviously a fascinating issue, um, digital political ads and the, the regulatory framework around them. We're seeing an election cycle where, you know, they're playing an even more important role uh, with the ability to target the message in a way that, that TV and radio can't, and different organizations being involved in the process from um, you know, nonprofits, charities, uh, through super PACs and candidates, all being involved in the election in some form or fashion, um, placing those ads. And so it's really, um, you know, a great time to talk about it. In some ways, we're in a little bit of a lull just as we get into the final home stretch. Uh, most of the ads, I think, have, have been placed or, or in final placement, um, even on the digital side, although they could, of course, get switched around a little bit um, and added to in the, the coming week. But before we, we dive into all of that, you know, I think it, it is going to be helpful to kind of just talk a little bit about what we might see over the next few months if we don't have a uh, clear-cut winner in the election. Um, and so the idea is not to, uh, you know, make everyone too nervous, but really to talk just through the timeline where there may be opportunities for additional political advertising, for um, companies to design policies around a period where there could be a little bit of chaos or uncertainty. Um, to make sure that they're you know, playing their part in the process um, and, and kind of understanding what those timelines might be because I think it's something that, um, you know, maybe we learned a little bit about uh, back in, in high school civics, um, but they, you know, haven't really unpacked it as much recently. So we'll run through a few of these slides before we get into the truly uh, digital uh, advertising part of the, the political discussion today. So on this slide, we have a uh, timeline for um, kind of what, what to expect. We've obviously crossed over the party convention piece. We've got our, our uh, Republican and Democratic presidential candidates selected um, to the primary elections. We're now at the point of casting ballots on November 3rd um, with the general election, or even before. As you know, there are a lot of people voting um, um, early ballot, absentee ballot, um, up uh, until the election day. 
but on November 3rd, we will have the final vote. And of course, the, the one kind of thing that everyone needs to remember is that when you cast your ballot for one of the two presidential candidates, you're actually not voting for that person. You're voting for the slate of electors from your state to go to the Electoral College and cast the vote. And that has a few implications that could come into play. Um, it's possible for electors to not follow the, the vote in the state um, if, if they so choose. A number of states have what they call faithless elector laws, which either seek to remove those candidates, th those electors, or punish them in some way if they don't vote according to the popular vote. Um, the Supreme Court has upheld those laws, so um, generally speaking, who you vote for will be who your electors vote for if, the, uh, if that candidate wins. So once the, the election happens, though, then the, the vote has to be certified. And kind of looking at this yellow uh, calculator there, <clears throat> that's the, pro the process whereby the states count the votes, um, ascertain the official results, and then send them into the, um, um, the federal government by December 8th. And so if you're thinking about a contested election or recounts or problems with the election, generally speaking, you're going to be thinking about this period between November 3rd and December 8th which is what they call the safe harbor deadline for the states to send in all of their, their information, uh, all the vote counts. If, there are, um, if they don't quite meet the safe harbor, they do at least have to get them in by December 14th, which is when the electoral, vote, uh, the electoral college meets and casts their vote. Um, so kind of drop dead for getting all of the, the, the votes counted accurately and certified would be December 14th. Um, and then the electoral college, uh, um, vote is counted in Washington on January 6th. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that just to, to remember what, how, what that looks like because the process could be interesting. And then, of course, on January 20th, as long as everything goes according to plan, we will have um, the inauguration of the president. So, you know, the key here with the electoral vote uh, process is that it really comes down to a few states um, where the, the margins are pretty close. This map kind of shows a number of them on gray. Some of these have moved closer or further away, depending on um, where we are in the, the polling cycle. But there's certainly a few states, the main people identify Pennsylvania um, as kind of a key swing state this year, where um, depending on where the candidates get the rest of their votes, that, that state could come into play and be very important. Um, things to kind of look out, of, out for over the next couple of days, um, you know, in, in weeks, would be if people have trouble casting votes, um, if there are difficulties counting the votes, um, or if there, um, and if that could lead to competing slates of electors um, when the electoral college meets, um, which could then lead to you know rejection of electors and a contingent election kind of process. But all these things, just to kind of again to kind of frame your perspective to to think about what could could go on. Um, you know, there's a possibility if a candidate were to die. There's a variety of scenarios um, that that come into play. Um, when we're talking about voting, um, there's obviously the, the, the big concern about the number of absentee ballots, what it will look like to be voting in the middle of a pandemic, um, how to count those ballots, uh, staffing issues. You know, that's one thing we've heard, are there maybe fewer people who are willing to volunteer in the election, uh, on the election day, so there, it could take longer to get uh, ballots cast, ballots counted, things like that. So those are all things that could happen with the voting which then potentially lead to problems with the counting and certification. Um, there are four terms that kind of, kind of come about that you'll see over here on the right side. Um, the canvas of the votes, that's an important piece. That's where the official numbers get tallied and, and reported. Um, the recount is something that happens at the state or local level, depending on uh, state law. So it's a fun if some states have mandatory recounts, if it's within a certain margin, Others allow candidates to request it, depending on how far apart it is, or sometimes a candidate has to post a, a bond in order to do a recount. Um, but those are all things that can happen. A contest is where you challenge the results of the election. That's beyond the recount. That's where you're saying there was fraud, there was a problem with the ballots that were submitted. Um, we're, we're challenging the results. The states each have a process uh, through their state court system that this would happen. And then it's also possible to have litigation outside of the election. We've seen uh, you know, a tremendous amount of litigation, even in the past week or so, over uh, absentee ballot deadlines and things like that, with the Supreme Court issuing decisions um, at the last minute, potentially changing some of the rules. So there's all kinds of uncertainty on that front that can happen as well. Um, 
beyond that, once you um, get to the point where hopefully we have a clear result um, in each state, then the Electoral College meets and, and the, the ballots get, get uh, counted um, within the, the state delegation, and then um, uh, they get sent on to Congress for counting the electoral votes. So um, one of the things to, to kind of keep in mind, this is January 6th, it's a joint session of Congress. This is the new Congress. So we're, we're voting um, for a number of new senators uh, this time around, or, or to reelect existing senators. We're voting on uh, the House of all 500, uh, 435 seats in the House. So the people who are sitting there now in Congress may not be the people who are sitting there on January 6th to count these votes. And as we'll talk about in a second, that, that could have a, an important impact on the process. Um, ideally, the, the electoral votes are, are simply read out and counted, and we get to a, one candidate that hits 270 votes, and we have a winner. If there are challenges to the electoral votes, if, the, if for example, a state sends two slates of electors, um, you know, it's important to remember that in 2000, when Florida was the, the problem child state, um, there, before the Supreme Court issued its final decision, which happened on December 12th, just to give you a framework, that was you know, two rounds of litigation up and down to the Supreme Court. Uh, the final decision was issued on, on December 12th, right before the Electoral College met. But there were, before that decision, there were two slates of electors potentially that were going to show up to cast ballots for two different candidates. So had that happened, then Congress would have, would have had to determine which selection of, uh, of electors they were going to vote for, which again um, can be, it presents some, some difficulties. If no one gets to 270 because there's a tie, because there's um, votes that are thrown out because for whatever reason, then there's a very interesting process. The House selects the president and the Senate selects the vice president. What's really interesting is the House process. Each state gets one vote for all of their members of Congress. So a state like California that has 40 some odd representatives gets one vote. Um, they meet by state and cast their ballots and the majority vote would win. So you have a situation where, um, you know, right now we have um, 26 majority Republican delegations and 23 uh, Democratic delegations in Pennsylvania, our state of most interest is tied. So some of those could flip um, very easily uh, in this election process. There are some states with only one member of Congress, some states where it's a very evenly divided delegation. So the outcome of the House races could affect how the House votes for um, um, the president. The Senate, it's a majority vote of the senators with the current vice president casting um, uh, the, 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 the tie-breaking vote if necessary. So what if they still can't figure out a, a, a decision? What if they can't decide who is going to be um, um, president based on that process? Then it, the, it, if the Senate picks a new vice president, whether that be um, Pence or Harris, the new vice president becomes the acting president until the House manages to pick a president. If there's no new vice president, if the Senate can't reach a decision, if um, for some reason, um, then it would go to the Speaker of the House, um, who would serve as the acting president, and then it would go to the um, President Pro Tem of the Senate, which is who is currently Chuck Grassley of Iowa. What's fascinating here is that you that under the Constitution, either of those people would have to resign their seat in Congress or the Senate to take the the acting president's job. So you would have a situation where if Nancy Pelosi were to become president, she could no longer be Speaker of the House. Um, and similarly, if, if she said, no, I don't want to do it, and Senator Grassley took it on, then you could potentially have an outcome change in the Senate in terms of the majority or minority, depending on the number there. So fascinating sort of set of permutations. Just thought it'd be helpful to uh, walk everybody through that a little bit, just to get a good sense of why political ads could still be important even in the next few weeks as we go through this. But, you know, certainly on election night, look for states that are close. Look for states where the absentee ballot hasn't been counted until after, until the election day gets here. Most of the swing states start counting ahead of time. So that should help that process a little bit. Um, you know, look for people claiming challenges to absentee ballots being mailed in, the deadlines, courts shifting deadlines, things like that. 
those are the kind of things that I think you want to watch out for to kind of see how chaotic or hopefully not um, this process might be. So that's our, our um, quick tutorial on, um, on sort of what to look out for uh, over the next few weeks. Hopefully it's all for nothing and, and it's a quick decision, but if not, that'll give you a good sense hopefully of, of what might be out there. Um, so now I will, well now we'll get into the true digital advertising um, CLE that we, we promised you and not a lesson on constitutional um, theory. So I will hand it back over to Rob to talk a little bit about sort of what we've seen from the policymakers as we work in this area. Um, Rob and I have both interacted quite a bit with, with state elections officials um, who regulate political spending, um, with state legislators, and sort of how they view digital advertising and, and how that affects how they approach the regulation. Rob? Yeah, thanks, Ron. Um, that's always always interesting to see, and it's a good refresher on uh, things you should all know, but clearly forget as uh, we get used to easy elections. Um, so like Ron said, we talk a lot with um, regulators, at mostly at the state level, but also in the federal level, about how digital political advertising works. So you see here kind of the, the folks that are in the, the um, industry. You got your candidates, your campaigns, consultants, uh, you know, advertising uh, firms, publishers, and all of the usual ad tech players, so your exchanges, demand side platforms, flat side platforms. And it's a very complex and large industry. Um, you would need to get not even in the political realms, in the general digital uh, uh, realm. And, and Rob, I would one of the things that makes, sorry, sorry Rob, if I could, one, one of the things that I think makes that interesting from a state regulator perspective is that typically, when you're thinking about like a state legislator regulating an industry, it's kind of a one part of an industry. If you're, in, if you're regulating coal production or you're regulating, you know, widget makers, whatever it may be, it's a, it's a smaller universe as opposed to this whole swath of both, you know, everyone from the candidates to the, the digital ed tech companies, which makes it, I think, harder to think about a regulatory framework than if you're just dealing with like one actor in a particular space. Right. And that takes us well to our next slide where kind of when we when we do engage with those folks, this is what they think of, right? It's a candidate, a PAC, somebody wants to get a political message out. They hire a firm to get that message out. They contract with the publisher and then the ad goes out. Um, think of this as very much the television and print media um, way of the world, right? It's you know, it, candidate A wants to get something out there, their ad firm goes up to the New York Times, and the New York Times runs an ad because they paid for it. Uh, we all know, of course, that is not how it works online. But when you look at the regulations that are proposed in a lot of places, it's very much applying that old school um, framework onto the digital advertising uh, uh, world. So it's, you know, disclosures about the candidates, who paid for what, that type of thing. But we know that the world looks much more like this. Um, where there's a bunch of intermediaries throughout the ecosystem that are all part of the system. There's the agencies, of course, but then they go to the demand side platforms, they go out to the exchanges, they go out to the supply side platforms. That eventually ends up with an ad on a consumer's device. And of course, all of that happens in milliseconds, which is, you know, so it's, it's all working together, it's all going very quickly, and the regulators aren't thinking of it in this way. So you'll see a lot of things placed on the candidates or maybe on the publishers, but it's missing the entire way things work. So a candidate might not know where their ad ends up necessarily. Um, it could pop up on any number of local news or major media platforms. It could uh, pop up in the top of the frame and the bottom of the frame. And so the regulators need to start to, and when we talk to them, we describe this to them and we talk about how it's much more complicated. We need to make sure that regulations all work together so that the system can continue to function, but that consumers and voters still get the information they want about how, why they're getting ads, who's sending them ads. And so when you take that into account, I think it's interesting to use that frame and think about the whole industry together when we talk about state and federal regulations that m are in place and might come into place, which uh, Ron's going to start walking us through now. Great. Thanks, Rob. And, um, you know, I, I think it really is important to, to think of the, the frame of mind, if you will, of, of regulators thinking about TV, thinking about print, 
um, in, in how different that really is in terms of the number of actors. When you write a definition of of, of a ad plat or of a platform, um, you know it, it can sweep in a whole variety of, of actors who may or may not have anything to do with you know knowing the content of the ad or being able to per keep a record of an ad that goes across their system in you know the blink of an eye. And so that I think is an important piece to to keep in mind of of what we're kind of up against um, dealing with. Um, um, you know, this framework. And so, um, you know, I think a couple of, of, of important further background points about sort of, um, you know, why do, why do policymakers care about digital ads separate and apart from other kinds of advertising? And I think there's a few things. You know, we, we've, we've seen the experience in history um, over the past couple of election cycles where it does seem that there have been issues with the digital ads. Um, you know, there's the, the experience with Cambridge Analytica and the information that it was uh, collecting uh, the, the foreign intervention piece, I think, is a, is a really important one. But it's also worth noting on that foreign intervention side that as we talk about what the states in, have done and what the federal government has been thinking about doing, for the most part, they're focused on paid political advertising. Um, you know, a, 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 a candidate, a PAC, a nonprofit, whatever it may be, purchasing an ad or um, it, it, to say vote for a candidate. When in reality, what we've seen was a lot of those things were more designed to be organic posting type things. Some were paid, but for the most part, it was it was you know, bot farm type type operations. And so we're not. Like, there's a certain sense that the problem and the remedy are not um, not equal to one another, which of course is nothing new in the world of regulation. But I think here in particular, it's um, you know there's a there's a maybe a bigger divide between what we're seeing. Um, I think with the, the other thing that, that the regulators um, tend to see is that um, um, they, they, there's, because they see digital as sort of very granular, they think that you can or, or think that there's an opportunity to get even more information. You know, a television ad buy, you get the, the amount of advertising and what the ad was, uh, but you don't necessarily know the number of impressions, for example. Regulators here think, gee, maybe we should get the number of impressions. Maybe we should get the demographics used to target um, and sort of add on to the normal sort of election regulatory framework um, that, might be, that might be out there. So those are all, I think, just important, so again, sort of background things to think about as we kind of walk through some of these rules and what's there. Um, we're going to now start with the um, federal election uh, rules that apply, and um, then we'll talk about the state stuff. It's important, I think, to, to break down federal and state in this environment as well. Um, and remember that federal law covers ads about federal candidates. So even though you, know, you might have ads in the state of California for a particular federal candidate, the California law doesn't apply. It, it's all focused on if it's a federal candidate, federal law applies. It completely preempts state law does not apply to a federal campaign. Whereas if you are doing an ad campaign you know, for a governor, for state legislator, for a ballot measure, that's when the state laws come into play. So, you know, I, I've had some clients where they say, well, gee, I, I, you know, I, I'm taking political ads in California. What do I have to do? And the first step is to figure out whether or not it's a state ad or a federal ad, because that will affect how, um, how the laws apply. So on the federal side, there's sort of the traditional political advertising world of um, um, the Federal Election Commission disclosures, um, as well as rules about disclaimers that go on the ads, and then the sort of political file that the um, TV stations and radio stations have to maintain. So the um, disclosure requirements are that candidates, super PACs, um, nonprofits that are paying for express advocacy or what's called an electioneering communication, which is something that references a candidate, they have to disclose the amount they spend on particular, uh, on their, ve their vendors, um, and file periodic campaign finance reports with the FEC. So you could look at, you know, the Biden report or the Trump report and figure out 
how much they're spending on a particular um, digital, their you know, maybe their digital event, uh, creative, or their um, politic, their digital ad buyer, but you wouldn't necessarily get down much below that. Same way that you could do television buys and things like that. The ads themselves, if they are run by a, a political action committee or a candidate, federal level have to include a disclaimer that says paid for by the name of the group, not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee, and include a website. Um, that rule generally applies. There's some room around the margins for ads that are too small, but for the most part, they're going to re require the, that disclaimer on there. Um, and then, as I said, there's the political file, which is the information the TV stations maintain about how much they paid, uh, what the ad was, and who bought the ad. It's that sort of political file piece that, that um, we, we're seeing in some proposals to get to um, regulate um, sort of the, the, the digital advertising world that doesn't translate exactly uh, to the, uh, the state world. So at the federal level, sort of coming out of the 2016 election and um, the, the concern about foreign influence and increased amounts of um, spending on the, di on the digital led to a few different um, uh, bills being introduced to that would um, impose additional disclosure requirements on federal political ads. None of these have passed um, since 2016, primarily because we have divided government and different uh, sides have different views on these things. But what's interesting is that in particular, the Honest Ads Act, which was kind of the um, broadest piece of legislation and, and sort of the, the one that, that would have imposed some pretty substantial record keeping requirements has become the model for what a lot of states have imposed. And we'll talk about sort of what those states have done um, in just a second, but it's an interesting sort of framework. And so one of the things I think that, that comes through with all of these um, pieces of legislation is a difficulty between sort of applying existing law to digital platforms um, versus trying to increase the disclosures that are required otherwise. And what I mean by that is there's, you know, you hear a lot of talk about dark money. Um, I, I'll put big scary air quotes around that, which is money that's spent by particularly 501c4 organizations, social welfare groups, where the donors don't have to be disclosed. And there are a number of advocacy organizations that hate that, that concept. And so, some of the disclosure that's not currently in federal law for TV or, or um, radio or other spending, there's been an attempt to use some of this legislation to, to strengthen those disclosures and really change sort of the, the framework for, for what gets disclosed or not. And I think that's where some of the pushback has come on some of these um, um, rules. But just basically the construct of the Honest Ads Act is that it would impose uh, sort of a digital file-like requirement on platforms um, that, um, that in, in there have been different versions of the, of the legislation to figure out how many people, you know, impressions, view, uh, viewers, clicks, whatever it may be, that, that go through that platform um, to, before they have to do this, but they would have to keep a robust record of each ad that's been um, filed um, each ad that, or that, that's been run on that platform in a way that would be very hard for different entities to do, particularly if it's an ad network and the statute targets sort of the, you know, the, 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 the website as opposed to the ad network. Um, and the, the, I think one of the problems with the Honest Ads Act is that it doesn't distinguish clearly um, which entity in the sort of the digital ecosystem it's talking about. Um, you know, I think there's a chance that if, if we have a change in party control in the Senate so that you have a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate and a Democratic president, then you could see something like the Honest Ads Act start to move. And I think hopefully if that were the case, there would be an opportunity to, you know, work on some of the, diffi the, the difficult issues and explain to the legislators, you know, wait a minute, this, this, you know, we need to work on these definitions to make sure we've got the right parties in the system covered here. Um, so before we, we switch over to the states, I will uh, remind everybody that you know, this, for your CLE requirement, 
um, we, you have to enter a code. And so the CLE code for today is politics. Politics is the CLE code. So make sure you make a note of that so that you um, have that for uh, any CLE credit that you might um, be seeking. So at the state level, the um, disclosures, the, the rules, um, you know, the, there's existing rules that talk about a disclaim, the disclaimer piece, uh, which again is the sort of the paid for by. Each state has its own little framework. Um, some states, such as California, uh, if you're doing independent expenditures, your group has to include your top five donors on your disclaimer and it gets very complicated. Even aside from any digital rules, um, the, those rules apply. Um, record keeping and disclosure requirements on political committees. But what's really starting to come into play again are these state laws in a handful of states so far um, uh, where there are rules on the platforms. We're, we're talking California, Washington, New York, um, Nevada, to name just a few of kind of the bigger states that impose these requirements. And those um, fall into kind of two categories, I would say. One is, is a, um, a framework that requires um, the, the platforms to make sure that there is a disclaimer sort of attached to the ad um, or a way for users to click through to get there. The others, and, and those generally work fairly well. They're relatively simple to do because it still often requires the candidate or the advertiser to do a lot of the work. But the hard part is that some states have imposed requirements for um, maintaining records um, off of, of their, their websites or of the, the digital political ads. And in particular, you know, one of the early adopter states, if you will, was Washington State. And um, they have um, re imposed requirements on platforms to maintain records of all of the political um, advertising that has been done. And Washington has, they're, I've, I've talked to their, the state regulators there and they basically say, look, we have this rule in place, it's been around for over 30 years that applies to anyone who basically produces a political advertisement in any form, you gotta maintain records and there's a right of public inspection. And so just like the print shop that makes yard signs or the, um, the, the mail shop that prints uh, direct mail, has to keep these records, so too a platform has to keep records of all the advertising. And while they are you know, willing to, uh, to hear out the, the concerns about the, the complex nature of the digital ecosystem, their laws still apply to platforms and is written and they, and they enforce their laws, which we'll talk about in a little, in a little while. Um, and so you, what you see is that a lot of platforms in don't carry Washington State advertising because they they can't for technical reasons or they won't because they're concerned about sort of the, the ramifications for their business um, get involved in in Washington state uh, political advertising and so um, it's important to you know to, to, to make sure you understand um, the the rules there and, and how that works um, for um, um, if, if you're going to accept political advertising there. Um, other states have simpler rules. New York's rule is relatively straightforward um, in that it requires um, independent, independent expenditure committees. So these are groups that are third-party groups that support or oppose a candidate. When they, when they place an ad with a platform, they have to certify to the platform that they have um, that they've registered with the state as an independent expenditure committee. And so there's not a separate requirement on the platform. In New York is, is unique in that it, it created a public database of ads. So if you're a political advertiser in New York, you submit your ad to a database that was created by, by a New York regulator, as opposed to requiring the, um, the platform to maintain a copy of the ad um, th there. So that's also helpful. Um, Maryland is a, was another early adopter state that passed something like the, the Honest Ads Act um, um, shortly after um, uh, the 2016 elections. It had those two parts. One was a very effective um, program for using um, either for the disclaimer in a way to deal with short disclaimers, um, including iconography, uh, 
which we'll talk a little bit about the, the Digital Advertising Alliance self-regulatory program that, that includes um, ways to deal with that. And Maryland very quickly said, yes, we, we love the idea of a DAA icon um, as a good way to, to solve for some of these problems. But we also in Maryland have this, this platform record keeping requirement, which was actually challenged by some of the newspapers, the Washington Post and Baltimore Sun said, wait a minute, we, we don't maintain these records. These are not only um, you know, records that, 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 that the ad networks maintain, but, but to require us as newspaper publishers uh, violates our First Amendment rights um, as the press to keep all, to, to provide these, this information to the state. And they, the, the newspapers won an injunction against the state law. Maryland still applies the law against non-newspaper um, publishers and, and platforms, but um, the newspapers themselves don't have to comply. But it, it does mean that a lot of state, a lot of advertisers, and a lot of platforms won't take Maryland state ads because they can't uh, satisfy the record keeping uh, requirements. Um, and in fact, the last Maryland election, the, the statewide election for the governor, Two years ago, there was virtually no digital political advertising in the state because of those rules. So um, that's a, you know, a lot of information to, to unpack there for uh, just a second. Um, um, the, the, actually, I do want to touch sorry, briefly on California. Um, California has a law that at first blush sounds really complicated um, and imposes all kinds of requirements on the platform. But when you start to parse through it, it has two good features. One is that it, it only applies to the platform that sells directly to the, the advertiser. So there's no sort of upstream um, responsibility so, because they, they recognize that there are you know, multiple handoffs in that definition of platform. The other thing that California does is that it only applies to a relatively narrow set of ads where there's not a click through to a to a, um, a campaign page that has the disclaimers or disclosures on them, um, or that it applies if it's a paid post in a social media feed. So it's there, I think they want additional disclosure sort of because it seems like a more organic kind of advertising and maybe people don't realize that it's a paid ad. Um, but for simple banner ads or pre-roll video, those kind of things, it would not actually apply. So it's, it's slightly more limited um, than in other places. You're just a little bit of a, um, talk a little bit about the enforcement here. Um, in you know, Washington state is a good example of a state that is very active in their uh, political advertising enforcement. Um, there, they have gone after two of the very big companies um, in the space, even though those companies said, we're not going to take Washington state political advertising. We can't comply with the rules. We don't want to comply with the rules. It's too complicated. We're, we're not accepting ads in that, in that state. Well, they managed to get some slip through because, as you all know, it's a, it's a you know, very automated process at times. Some slip through. The Washington regulator found them, and they entered into um, um, settlements with um, the state um, in, two, or in 2018 to settle the fact they were, were selling ads they, they've had another run in um, with the state and there's a current lawsuit going on for uh, violating the state law, even though, again, they're trying very hard not to sell ads in the space. So, um, um, you know, that's, I think, an important um, um, con consideration to make sure you have a good compliance program that if you're not taking ads to make sure that you're, you're not actually um, taking them. There are a number of states that have additional um, rules or laws sort of pending or legislation pending. Um, you know, I think there was a, a sense in 2020 that there was going to be, uh, if not a wave, at least a new round of, of legislation passed. And then, of course, like so many other things we say, and then the pandemic hit, um, and those kind of became much less important. I think there will be movement next year probably um, in some of these states. Um, with additional disclosures required. I think that, um, you know, I know Washington State is working on some updated rules. They've issued a report um, that would look toward a uh, registration and digital identification process for each ad. Um, I think there are some technical challenges there that will have to be ironed out and figured out, but they certainly want to find a way to sort of marry the 
the, cam the candidate disclosures and disclaimers with a database process so that there's a bit of cross-checking and making sure that people aren't sort of skipping out on their, their disclosure requirements. So we'll kind of see where those go. So layered all on top of this has been an effort by industry to at least to try and simplify the um, disclaimer side of things. And so Rob, I'll turn it over to you to talk about industry self-regulation. Yeah, thanks Rob. So in following 2016, when all of these new state laws and all the built, um, political advertising came around, the Digital Advertising Alliance um, saw an opportunity to help with that, those issues. Um, the, D, the Digital Advertising Alliance, the DAA, um, has long been a leader in self-regulation and in bringing transparency to the advertising uh, community. And one of the main focuses of all these state laws is transparency. You know, who's sending, who's sending me inside, why am I seeing it, things like that. So as you all know, you know, starting in 2009 and continuing on, the DAA has um, developed different uh, applications of its self-regulatory principles uh, across new and evolving technology and practices. Started out with focusing on online behavioral advertising, then updated the code to cover multi-site data, and then uh, mobile uh, advertising, cross-device uh, linking, and then most recently with political ads. So in 2016, DAs uh, convene a, a group of industry um, folks, including, uh, you know, new folks at the table from the political advertising agencies and the folks that actually help place these candidate ads and say, what can we do to help? Is there a way we can bring um, recognized, you know, iconography, the DAA icon, and help create a system where we can show voters, not, not only consumers, but voters now, you know, um, that the industry is being responsible. And then we can work with states and the federal government to make sure that there's a workable solution in the marketplace. Um, so what, is, what does the DAA's program do? It identifies an ad as a political ad. It focuses on express advocacy uh, as opposed to what are called issue ads. So those are those ads that say vote for, reelect, support this nominee or, or that. Those are the clearly identified political ads that the DAA's program applies to. And there's a lot of the state programs or state laws apply to. Um, it provides a simple way to let users obtain <clears throat> more information. It can be customized based on the platform, the state law, you know, whatever you need to comply with for your particular campaign. It provides a, a floor, a minimum of what you need to do. And then it allows states to, to build on top. And if you're going to engage in Washington, you might need to add a few more details to your disclosure. But at least here's something to start with. And as Ron said, we took this uh, proposal to Maryland as they're working on their regulations around their new um, political ads legislation and said, we want to help. Here's a good way that industry has put together a, uh, a program, an icon, that can make even the small digital ads have a way to provide these disclosures to people. Um, you saw this also, you know, a similar but separate issue when the FDA was trying to work on pharmaceutical digital advertising and how to put those lengthy disclosures into, um, into ads online. You know, there's a whole issue around the size and the scope. We said, we wanted to get in front of that and said, the DAA said, hey, we've done this for a long time with the, the blue, blue triangle in the corner of ads that shows, you know, why, are we, why am I seeing this ad? We applied those to political ads and helped develop this program. And Maryland took it up and built in, not the specific program, but a way that this program can comply with the Maryland requirements for transparency. So you'll see it here. This is kind of how it works. And it also, can work with um, interest-based advertising. We all know that a lot of political ads aren't just broadcast out to the internet, they're also targeted based on any number of factors. And those targeted ads need to comply with the uh, DAA's online behavioral advertising requirements, but also when they're political ads, need to comply with this political ad disclosure requirement. So what the DAA said was, okay, we're going to put, because it's a political ad, that should take primacy. People should know they're being served a political ad. And you'll see the purple triangle in the corner. But when they click on it, you'll see both disclosures. You'll see all the requirements that you uh, need to list for your political ad, and also the, tar the OBA requirements that the DA um, require, uh, places on companies. So what needs to be in those uh, pop-ups? So for the political ad, you see the name of the advertiser, contact information, um, all these, this list here, I won't go through it. And we derived this list when we were developing the program with the DAA 
to say, what are the requirements that are out there? It's all based on state laws. So we looked at Maryland and Washington, federal laws, and said, what are the commonalities between them? And so that's where, that's where the DAA program applies. It says, if you're a political advertiser, you need to include these in your pop-up in your when someone clicks on a link. And importantly, the political advertiser is the entity or person that pays for the ad. So this really applies to the campaigns, the PACs, those folks that are buying the express advocacy. However, in order to help people comply with this, we've seen a lot of some platforms start to build into their, uh, their flows. Is this a political ad? If so, we're going to serve this purple icon, and then you're going to list off all these required, this required information. So it's a way that the industry has helped political campaigns um, comply with both their legal and their self-regulatory compliance um, requirements, and it's kind of an easy flow. So it's not an extra burden on folks. It's just one more click of a button, enter a little bit of information. And here we can see most recently, this is a, this is a current 2020 ad uh, for a, I believe, New Mexico candidate. You'll see the political ad icon in the corner pops up like every other targeted ad, but this time because it's a political ad, you see the purple icon. And it doesn't do, it doesn't impose those um, database requirements that starting to think about. It doesn't uh, require disclosures that are beyond what's generally required by the state. And because it applies to the political advertisers, it applies to the campaigns. And it is subject to the DA's accountability program. And if um, the uh, business, Better Business Bureau's national program, which is one of the accountability partners that the DAA um, works with, has already begun enforcing and putting out notices to say, hey, we noticed your ad doesn't carry this icon, doesn't have this disclosure, please bring it up to date. Um, they have a, a rolling list that they, they put out periodically about um, potential violations and campaigns they're working with. So this is something that's live in the ecosystem. And um, you know, if you begin to accept political ads, you should think about how you will help your political advertisers comply with the program um, so they don't get a letter or a call from the, the Better Business Bureau or the other accountability programs over at the Association of National Advertisers, the ANA. Um, so that's just a little bit of how the industry has tried to work to, with governments, with regulators, to produce a program that is workable uh, for the digital world, that is useful to, to voters, it's an easy click away to learn a lot of valuable information, um, but doesn't step beyond the requirements of, of state laws at, at this point. And um, we've seen, we've talked with Maryland, we've talked with Washington, they're receptive to these things. Um, they each have their own idiosyncratic kind of takes on what's required, as Ron said when he went through the state laws. But in general, the use of an icon, the use of some signal to consumers that says, or voters that says, this is a political ad, and here's who sent it to you, why, why are you getting this ad? They work hand in hand together. So it's been a developing process. We've seen a lot of uptake in 2020 across the industry. And um, I think going forward, you know, we'll continue to build on the product as new laws come into effect. So all that being said, you've now seen the state and federal issues uh, around this, the regulations, the laws. You've seen what the industry has tried to do to help comply with those laws and to help move the conversation forward in the digital realm. So next is kind of a conversation of what's this all mean for you as either exchanges, ad networks, advertisers, whatever. <laughs> How does it affect you as the, uh, an entity in the world that wants to work in the political ad realm? And um, I think I'm going to let Ron uh, take that off here, but we'll, we'll just discuss a few of the potential pain points potential and potential benefits of engaging with political advertising. Great. Thanks, Rob. And, you know, I think one of the, the interesting pieces with the DAA um, icon the DA went and talks not only to Maryland with, with great success to talk about how it could solve some of the disclaimer problems because of the, in particular, the variability of, in ad size um, that exists in the digital space and how you, you know, squeeze information in or how you give people a clear signal to, to be able to click through to get that information. The, you know, we, they also talked to the Federal Election Commission, and which is an agency that is uh, difficult to deal with um, it, it's also lacks a quorum of commissioners, so they can't actually make decisions right now. But it was interesting talking to some of them. They, the commissioners found it to be a very useful way to satisfy federal law and that they could work with, um, you know, the regulations to, to allow for, for that icon. Others basically said there's no way anyone will ever know what this icon is. We'll never um, um, be able to adopt this. And I'm, I'm hopeful that as more and more states adopt 
you know, the, the ability to use iconography as the DAA icon becomes more prevalent, that that may at some point, if there are ever commissioners at the Federal Election Commission again, um, you know, allow them to say, look, yeah, it is working and it is a way to solve this problem. And it would, I think, in many ways simplify the, the ad placement difficulties because while you might have to check a box to say, you know, which state or federal ad you're running, it kind of all becomes one simple process, um, it, it, you know, that, that would allow for including the icon, simplifying the artwork and things like that that could really make that easier. Um, yeah. Before we, we talk about, sorry, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, Ron, just real quick on that. I think um, a lot of that um, uncomfortable uh, feeling from, from some of the commissioners is just based around unfamiliarity with the icon. Um, the DAA's uh, interest-based advertising icon, study after study shows as well recognized as consumers is signaling, you know, this is how I get more information about these ads. So uh, like Ron said, I think as it gets picked up, as more and more states and voters get used to it, that will um the continued education of the commissioners will, will help there too absolutely yeah no i think it's it's an unknown kind of thing in, in that the fact that it's being adopted more and more studies show that the, it, it can work um you know it, it was not to be a criticism of the the icon at all as much as the commissioners not you know necessarily appreciating what was there um we've had a couple of questions that i i think are worth answering as we we pivot to our next section um one was about California rules um, around um, kind of the, the donors, um, and even if it's not in the disclaimer, um, you know, can you make, can you, is there a way to find out who's paying for the ad? The group's names often make it impossible for casual viewers to understand who's behind the positions. And the answer is yes. California has a pretty robust disclosure regime. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about um, how 501c4s, you know, are considered uh, dark money. California has rules that, that prevent that, um, prevent sort of 1C4 from giving to another in reducing disclosures. So absolutely, there you can go to the California Secretary of State's website to find those filings if you're interested in, in knowing kind of who's behind an ad. Um, the other question we had was about complying with the Washington and Maryland laws. Um, I'll just Briefly, I'll, I'll just spin through the, the kind of Maryland piece a little bit. Um, because it's it's similar to, to Washington, but basically the records have to be maintained for a year following the next general election that the ads are um, available for, and they have to be available at request of the State Board of Elections within 48 hours after the ad is first disseminated. Um, the database that, that has to be created to, to maintain this um, has to be, has to include um, Let's see, where's my little cheat sheet here? It has to, to uh, include a copy of the ad. Um, the, sorry, the um, description of the proximate geographic locations where it was disseminated, uh, the description of the audience that received or was targeted to receive the ad, the total number of impressions, the dates and times that it was first and last disseminated, um, whether it supports or opposes a candidate or ballot measure committee, uh, all those pieces of information have to go in there. So you can see it's, it's a pretty robust um, requirement to maintain this information. Um, and it defines um, a um, platform as any public facing website, web application, or digital application, including a social network, ad network, or search engine that has 100,000 or more unique monthly US visitors or users and receives payment for qualifying paid digital communications. So it's a pretty broad um, um, list there. And, um, um, you know, in, in, in who's, who's covered and what is required. We had another question about sort of what states have adopted the DAA icon. Um, both Washington and Maryland's regulations currently very clearly will allow the use of the DAA icon in place of um, a, 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 an addition, a printed disclaimer on the uh, ad. Um, I think there are a few other states as well, and there are more, you know, that'll be coming online as the, the ad gains more widespread use within the industry. So um, with those uh, questions now, we'll, we'll chat a little bit about the benefits. You know, clearly there's a large market for um, increased revenue from, from political ads. Um, the, you know, new techniques and data uh, can, that, that are employed in digital advertising 
make it a key, you know, did uh, political advertising a key market here? Um, and really, I think, you know, it's the, particularly as some platforms, some networks decide they don't want to do political advertising for their own sort of PR or optics reasons that leaves an opening for other um, platforms to step in because uh, no, having been on a call today with a political organization, they're, they have money they want to spend to reach people. And, um, you know, digital, it, it, at this point, it, before the election, digital is one of the few ways you can get there, um, particularly if you don't have the money for, you know, a huge TV buy, which may or may not even be seen in a way that the digital ads would be seen. Yeah, and Ron, just on the, the new techniques and data point, it's, you know, it's looking at, well, you have very robust consumer um, ideas of consumers, right? Auto intenders, uh, green buyers, things like that. Um, being able to, to kind of tap into political feelings or feelings around issues can help improve overall advertising. And so it's a new way of looking at consumers as voters, not just as what they want to purchase. Um, and it all works together. So it's an interesting way to think about maybe engaging in political advertising. Absolutely, um, you know, but there certainly for for that increased um, uh, the benefits. There are also burdens, um, legal liability with the state laws that we've we've talked about. Um, there are general advertising laws and self regulatory requirements that apply um, to all ads um, or to political ads, and it's important to remember that those requirements exist. Um, and then I think there's this other piece of sort of um, reputational. Um, harm that can come with political ads, which I think is w one of the reasons why we see some of the platforms um, saying they don't want to do political ads. Um, that if, you know, if you're seen as con contributing to social unrest or political controversy, that can be a negative. And so it's an important sort of uh, reputational uh, risk to, to consider um, there as well. And on the point of state compliance, we had a question come in about uh, New Jersey. And New Jersey does also include a record keeping requirement for um, for political ads. Yeah, and you know, I, think, I think on um, your last point there, Ron, I'm, oh, sorry about right. reputational harm. You know, when we counsel clients here uh, at, at Venable, it's not only about what's the legal, you know, the minimum requirements from a legal standpoint, it's how is it going to look if you end up in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times? <laughs> We've seen that play out across multiple hearings and multiple articles about the 2016 election and now the 2020 election um, about the companies that were, were, were called up to the Hill to, to testify and that the various reporting about digital targeted um, political advertising and how that has helped fuel, at least, you know, in the view of the reporters, that helped fuel a lot of the um, issues around 2016 and what we're seeing now in 2020. Um, so it's another thing to keep in mind, as, as they, there are real-world consequences that, that may occur um, when engaging in this practice. So having a compliance program around what you're placing, what ads are being run through your platform, um, is, is one way to help think about that. And we also saw, just very recently, location data and tracking becoming a, a bigger issue, where um, you had a lot of headlines pop up where groups were targeting ads and prop alleged propaganda based on location and attendance at um, different protests and different rallies around the country. Um, location data is always a, a topic of interest uh, the Hill actors. And then seeing it applied to political advertising has been an area where a lot of regulators are starting to look at as well. And then, Ryan, if you want to talk about this last piece, I think it's a very interesting. Yeah, so particularly in light of the slides at the very beginning of the presentation, um, there's a, a, a movement afoot to either turn off political ads entirely, um, as we saw you know, with Twitter um, earlier in the year saying they just didn't want to do any paid political advertising, um, or it's around the election itself. And so there's a concern, I think, that if there's not a clear winner, if, there's, if we get into litigation, you know, in, in 2000, we, we didn't really have nearly the level of digital engagement that we do now, obviously. And so, the, the risk, I think, that some of the platforms see to accepting ads that say, you know, recount now or stop the recount or count every ballot or whatever those kind of messages might be could lead to further instability. And so there's a desire to kind of flip the switch to off once the election um, um, happens so that we can maybe cool things down. So if you're thinking 
wow, there's lots of opportunity between now and December 14th to get involved. There is, but think about also, you know, what the reputational harms might be if you're going to sell political ads in that space. Um, yeah, and to and that so, point, you know, as I, we come into a uh, – sorry, go ahead, Ryan. You, go ahead. Um, <laughs> sorry, guys. Sorry, folks. It's a technical issues here. <laughs> so, so as we get into the, you know, whether you sell or not, as we kind of round out our, our presentation um, here as we come up to the top of the hour, um, you know, really risk mitigation is the key. Um, and, Rob, you want to talk a little bit about sort of the data sources um, that come into play? Sure. And, you know, this is, I think, pretty standard stuff for a lot of, um, of people even outside the political advertising. But, you know, where is the data coming from? Uh, is it, you know, from a trustworthy source? Uh, you know, a lot of the point for 2016 was that data uh, was surreptitiously used uh, in that election. Um, is it permission for the purposes? Uh, are there opt-outs that apply? Anything like that you need to keep, keep in mind. And also, and it's kind of, uh, you know, with the disinformation, whether you have it or not for your, your more commercial ads, Considering what the content of the ad is, you know, do you want to be the person on the other end of the phone when the New York Times calls up and says, hey, why did this ad supporting uh, you know, political violence or some kind of unrest flow through your system? Uh, do you have a story to tell that says we try to catch all of these, you know, thinking about how either legal or platform-based you want to control the content that goes through your system? And then, Ron, if you want to close this out. Yeah, sure. And so just, you know, I think that the, the question I get from a lot of clients in the ad network space is, you know, is it a political ad at all? Um, how do I know if it's subject to these state laws? And the answer is, it's going to depend on each state. Um, and so it's, step one is sort of the, the funnel process of determining whether it's a political ad, whether it's federal, state, or local, um, and then figuring out who the advertiser is, because the rules could be different for a super PAC versus a candidate. Um, so once you figure out who, who it is and what it is, then you have to determine whether there are state-specific rules um, and whether the ad complies with the state law or um, if, if not, or if it's on the platform or the advertiser or whatever it may be. And then there's the question of doing diligence on the advertiser. Who is this group? Are they a reputable actor in the space? Um, is it a, you know, a Russian um, um, troll getting involved in the process? What, you know, who, who's there? And, you know, there's an important, I think, distinction between o being overly cautious in not allowing someone to advertise versus um, uh, because they don't have a whole track record versus shutting down sort of new organizations. You can create a C4 pretty quickly and be a legitimate actor. Um, and so you want to be cautious with how, um, you know, that plays out. So, um, I think those are the, the key points. You know, it's, it's really, you've got to design a unique system to handle your compliance for political ads compared to commercial ads. And if you do it, and you do it right, it can be very, uh, I think, you know, profitable for an ad network because it's very useful for the political actors to be able to engage in the digital space. Yeah, and uh, with you. that, we... Go ahead, Rob. <laughs> With that, we'll come to a close. Um, the, uh, we meant to leave some time for questions. We very helpfully took some during uh, the presentation. We appreciate the feedback and, and engagement. Um, if you have other questions, here's Ron and, and my uh, contact information. Uh, happy to follow up with folks offline. And uh, thank you very much for joining the Privacy and Policy webinar series uh, on political ads. Thank you all very much.